I've never shipped this hard in my entire life. In college, I had a rule for any friends who would come around for a movie night. No cell phones in the theater. And sure, the theater was my dorm room and the screen was a 32-inch LCD on my corner desk, but I stood by it. I'm very easily distracted by lights, sounds, and then I fixate on those distractions even after they've gone away. When someone opens up their phone in a theater, I stare at it and then spend the rest of the movie wishing that I could break it and then imagining various contraptions I could use to throw something at them that wouldn't have any collateral damage. If you're the type to look at your phone or talk a whole bunch in a movie theater, get off my channel and never come back. I'm being completely serious when I say that you are extraordinarily selfish, I hate you as a person, and I don't want you here. I always want to give as close to my full attention as possible to whatever I'm sat in front of. I can't just put a narrative on in the background the way so many people do. And while that's fine when sitting down to a two-hour movie, it becomes much harder when I want to get into a show, which is why for years I only watched sitcoms. They require less investment, both in terms of time and mindshare. As a result, I missed many of the big entries in prestige television, Mad Men, Breaking Bad, Game of Thrones, and since we're still well within the bounds of peak TV, the choice has become so paralyzing that I typically just end up watching Food Network competition shows because I don't have to think about them literally ever. And maybe I'm improving my quality of life by learning how much salt to put in pasta water and also what umami means. But I do try to watch at least some of the hit new series and every so often feel compelled to revisit something I always regretted missing, whether because of the critical acclaim, the way aspects of it have percolated into pop culture, the way my college girlfriend used to talk about all of the Tumblr gifts, all of the above. Hello, by the way, and welcome to the Week Air Review. You can call me totally willing to try human meat if it could be ethically sourced. And today, I am talking about Hannibal, the series, which I will clarify as such each time. No clarification means I'm talking about the character. Cool? Cool. Ever since Silence of the Lambs became the first and still only horror movie to win the Oscar for Best Picture because the Academy Awards are bad, Hannibal has been part of our culture. I mean, he's Hannibal the Cannibal. It's an iconic name attached to an iconic portrayal by Anthony Hopkins. Although his most famous line, Hello Clarice, is never actually spoken, much like Luke, I am your father, it is a rephrasing that we have propagated into our lexicon. But him being part of the vernacular means that nearly everyone who tunes into a Hannibal-centric television show already knows what he is, even if they don't know anything about who. And this puts creator showrunner Brian Fuller into an interesting spot. Hannibal the series begins long before Hannibal is imprisoned, when he was a well-regarded, if slightly unorthodox, psychiatrist pulled into the fold of the FBI's Behavioral Sciences Division to keep track of one of their top investigators. Obviously, none of the other characters can know that he's actually the infamous Chesapeake Ripper, but we do before we press play. In fact, it is the only thing we know. And so we are introduced to him halfway through the first episode as he is in the middle of dinner listening to beautiful piano music after a line about an unrelated killer eating his victims. Cute, right? The series takes ideas and scenes from the original Thomas Harris novels that I read probably half my life ago and barely remember. I know I went through Red Dragon, Silence of the Lambs, and Hannibal the Book, but I'm honestly not sure about Hannibal Rising. I think I would have missed the December 2006 release by a matter of months, and I'm not convinced I went back for it after. And in any case, all I really have are little images stuck in my head. The mind palace, the man made to eat his own face, the other guy with the cleft lip and janky teeth, a moment in Hannibal the book when Hannibal the character cuts through some dude's artery in his thigh, which was the first time I ever really considered the different ways that someone could bleed to death. And many of these memories do appear in some form or another. 
I watched with my girlfriend who had more recently seen D. Hopkins-led adaptations, and she would periodically comment about the changes in timeline between them. But that's just trivia. As far as I'm concerned, this is the definitive Hannibal story. And I have lost interest in going back to either the novels or the earlier films. The show never went to the Silence of the Lambs era, so I could still go back to that. But J.K. Rowling's recent turfery with that book published under her alter ego, whose name is shared with the psychiatrist who popularized conversion therapy about a man whose childhood trauma turned him into a transvestite and also a serial killer, makes it feel a little less fun. Admittedly, fun feels like an odd word to put near this extended narrative universe, but Anthony Hopkins got pretty campy with the role as the years went on, and there are definitely attempts to add some levity to the proceedings in the show. The fact that they mostly come as a result of Hannibal being a psychopath, having a grand old time setting terrible events in motion to see what happens, is immaterial. Dude's charm is infectious, which is part of the whole psychopath thing. Hannibal the series starts off with a pretty standard Monster of the Week structure, but it seems to be doing so under duress. The creators set up an idea where each week some bad new serial killer pops up, and it's up to Jack Crawford, aka Lawrence Fishburne's team of agents, to figure it out. Except it's not the agents who crack the case. It's Will Graham, played by Hugh Dancy, an instructor at the FBI Academy, but not a field agent because he wants to avoid the field because it's a dangerous place for him. Not physically, but mentally. You see, Will is special. He has a disorder of sorts that makes him a true empath, so he can completely understand a person's motivations just by seeing what they've done. And he can build complete psychological profiles by wading through a murderer's aftermath. Were this a traditional procedural, it would frankly be pretty boring. Will just figures things out and then it's over. There are episodes where we don't even really see the killer until they get captured or even much of the detective work that leads to that capture if there was any other than Will's magic. Since he is able to get in their head, he knows things about their employment status and their families and anything else that's narratively convenient. Is it cheap? Absolutely. And yet, The value of this empathic ability is not in how it helps Jack Crawford in a given episode, but how it hurts Will Graham in a given season. We are first introduced to Will as he is inhabiting a killer's mind, something we will see many, many more times. He stands in the room where it happened, and a light wipes away the remnants of the crime. The blood goes, then the bodies. And then he walks through it all, replicating the act, and so we get to see it play out, but with Will as the killer. He narrates and says at least three times the phrase, this is my design. Now, at the start here, we don't actually know Will like we know Hannibal, so I wondered if maybe we had a Dexter thing going. No, we didn't. He is just mimicking their actions, but this has a profoundly strange effect on the viewer, because in our eyes, Will is a killer. I don't have a counter, but I would guess that we see him kill more people than anyone else in the series, even Hannibal the Cannibal. And it doesn't matter that they're not actually his victims. We still see him commit the acts. You have to actively remind yourself that it's not him, that he's just able to get into their heads and embody them without becoming one of them. But can he? And of course, that is what the show is actually about, made far more complex when Will actually kills a man in order to save a hostage at the end of that first episode. Because from that point forward, Will is a killer. State-sanctioned violence, sure, but violence nonetheless, and the experience changes him. And so do all these horribly traumatic experiences. The monster of the week's work is revealed. Will has some sort of revelation, or someone else has a revelation that relates to Will, and then they wrap the killer up all nice and tidy, because who cares, I guess. Some of them seem like they have genuinely fascinating backstories, and I would have liked to see more of them, while others are just sort of there. But in all cases, it feels so 
perfunctory. Fortunately, it seems whatever network shackles forced them into that structure were largely shed after the first season because more arcs happen across episodes rather than being confined to the 142 minute slot. A lot of folks have complained for a long time about the bloating of shows in the age of streaming where there is no technical limitation on the length of episodes. And I understand and often agree with those complaints. But I think Hannibal, the series season one, could have benefited from another five to ten minutes per episode. And there are episodes that just do away with the monster altogether, or at least focus on the monster in the main cast. Because, of course, this is a show named after one of the most famous fictional serial killers. Like I imagine most Americans, I first saw Mez Mikkelsen in 2006, when he played the big bad in Casino Royale. His performance is memorable and not just because of the whole crying blood thing. He has a quiet sort of menacing, you know, he dresses up nicely, looks great in a suit, but it's hard to know what his deal is, helped by his very mild accent, one that's indiscernible as anything other than probably European, which adds to the mystery. And his take on Hannibal is that and more, which makes it fundamentally different from Hopkins' performance. Hopkins' Hannibal is simply creepy in a way that Mickelson's isn't. Some of this is because Mickelson is younger, handsomer, and has much better cheekbones than his predecessor, and the context in which we meet them matters too. Hopkins appears first as an imprisoned serial killer, while Mickelson is still just a guy, albeit one eating meat alone in a dark room, after Will realizes that the show's very first monster is a cannibal as well. But going deeper than that, this Hannibal appears more human, and that was a clear creative choice, and one allowed by what Hopkins did decades before. I mentioned earlier how everyone comes into the show with the knowledge of what Hannibal is. The groundwork has been laid by our culture, and you can feel the shark in the water even without a shot underneath the children swimming at the beach. And that eating shot doesn't count. It's basically a punchline, a joke for all of us to laugh at as we remembered that, right, this show isn't called Will. This Hannibal does not need to scare you cinematically, and if it tried to do so for an entire series, it would be frankly exhausting. But we're always waiting for the other shoe to drop, and when he finally does the thing we've always expected him to do, when the Hannibal we see becomes the Hannibal we know, it's actually cathartic. And then it's terrifying. Because it's obvious that Hannibal isn't really human, or at least that he has nothing like what we would call humanity. He is the purest sort of psychopath, someone who can talk about having a friend and that he feels something for his friend while at the same time working to undermine that person's faith in himself and his ability to cope and even live. And Hannibal can do so without seeing the contradiction. There's a sincerity to him no matter how true or false he's being, and when you mix that with the meticulousness of his presentation, a beautiful home, impeccable clothing, he just seems so perfect. And not to mention his cooking, because yes, Hannibal the Cannibal cooks a lot. Again, I don't have the stats, but I would bet that we spend at least a full episode's worth of time in Hannibal's kitchen over the course of the three seasons. I have to imagine that Mickelson spent some serious time training with a professional chef, or they got a double for him, because those knife cuts are real good, guys. There's some serious food porn going on as he prepares beautiful, complex dishes that sometimes happen to include human meat. But it's not just the food that's lovingly rendered, it's all of it. This is one of the most sumptuous television shows that I have ever seen. Hannibal the series first aired in April of 2013, which was an interesting time for television, because it was two months after Netflix dropped season one of House of Cards and changed things forever. It used to be possible to tell if something was made for TV or for cinema simply by looking at it, but that became less and less true as the 2010s wore on, and 
this feels like a milestone in there because it is so specifically cinematic in its presentation. I absolutely love the locations and the costumes and the use of color and lighting and also lack of lighting. And especially the show's willingness to allow its characters to be obscured by shadows for extended periods of time. And it just feels so thoroughly crafted, like something Hannibal himself would have put together. But when we're talking about what Hannibal presents, we must finally talk about the violence, because it's a point that could justifiably deal break this show for people. I knew going in that it was shockingly violent for broadcast television, but not what that meant. I realized almost immediately that that was underselling it. Yeah, it's pretty mind boggling what they got away with on a broadcast channel where there is ostensibly still standards and practices to worry about. But the presentation of that violence is shocking by any metric, in large part because of its beauty. And there is very little that Hannibal the series will not depict in glorious, glorious detail. That becomes clear from the first minutes of that first episode, and it doesn't get easier. Quite the opposite. The show continues to find new ways to surprise with its violence, and by the time we get to the third season, it seems pretty clear that they've said fuck it and are just doing whatever they damn well please. It's next level vicious and beautiful and strange and clearly the sign that they knew the show was ending and what was NBC gonna do about it now, huh? I knew the series was unceremoniously canceled after three seasons and that the internet has been freaking the actual heck out over the possibility of a fourth for the last five years, and that this has reached a fever pitch this year due to its new life on Netflix and also literally everything being awful, so why not start rumors about a comeback? It doesn't hurt anyone except for our news feeds. I, for one, had to tell Google that I'm not interested in Hannibal, even though I certainly am, because I was just over the near daily updates from different bullshit clickbait rags on whether or not there was a season four. The answer was always the same, and it was always no. But I didn't know what the desire for a fourth season actually meant. Did people just want more, or did they need more? Was it a world they wanted to spend more time in, or one they didn't get a resolution to? Basically, was I going to get some big, unsatisfying cliffhanger that soured whatever goodwill I correctly assumed the show would garner? And no, actually it, it doesn't. Again, although the show wasn't officially canceled until after season three began airing, it was extremely clear to me by the end of SO3 E01 that they knew it was coming. It felt different, not least because of how fast it was moving. I mentioned earlier that the show tended to rush through the Monster of the Week segments, but that was because it refused to rush the real character moments. Something had to give to make the time slot, and the creators decided that it should be the stuff that didn't matter to the larger arc. And that's fair. I am glad that they gave room to the main cast to play off each other in interesting ways and allow us to understand them and their relationships, because it's critical that we understand what we're watching Hannibal work to destroy. Storylines never wear out their welcome, but they have room to breathe until season three. Let me give an example. At the beginning of each episode, the credits say that the show is based on characters from the book Red Dragon, and it seemed like a tease, like they would eventually have to get to the story of Francis Dollarhide, aka the Tooth Fairy, aka the Red Dragon, right? And clearly Fuller and Co. felt that way too, because the story that I assume was meant to take up the entirety of season three ends halfway through. And then we're introduced to a new big bad, and it feels like the start of a new season, but it's not. We're halfway through season three. And then we get this incredibly condensed version of the story, and it's unfortunate because I'm sure that's what Fuller wanted season four to be, and so whatever beats had been planned out had to be jammed together. But at the same time, it's okay. I actually thought the ending of the show totally worked. It happened a bit more quickly than I might have liked, but I'm genuinely impressed with the way that they were able to wrap the story up in a satisfying manner, 
despite everything they felt compelled to get through. The ending succeeds to the point where I think any calls for a season four are misguided. It's sort of like BoJack Horseman. Creator Raphael Bob Waksberg had said in interviews that he could see the series going on for many years, but Netflix decided that season six would be the last, and so they had to make it work. And they did. The ending of BoJack Horseman is absolutely incredible, something I began to write a 10 out of 10 review of before ultimately realizing I just couldn't do it justice. And it's not like I've done Hannibal the show justice either, but I don't know how I could short of making a video measured in hours rather than minutes. You could write a thesis on the central relationship between Will and Hannibal, or at least a thesis-length fan fiction. I don't know what the kids call this particular OTP, Willable, Lecter Ham, but I get it. And that makes for a fascinating case study in toxicity. Hannibal comes to see Will as a friend, really his only friend. But he's also a psychopath and puts Will's life in literally mortal jeopardy just to see what would happen. And Will sees Hannibal as a friend too, even after he comes to understand what Hannibal has done to him. And if you strip away all the glitz and gore, you are left with this conflict. How do you solve a problem like Hannibal Lecter? While much of what happens in the show is centered around Will, his story rarely goes further than his relationship with Hannibal, which means everyone's story becomes hopelessly intertwined with this being of pure chaos, a prism through which everyone is refracted and irrevocably scarred from cuts both literal and figurative. And it works. The story twists and turns and creates real stakes as you genuinely fear for the safeties and sanities of a cast that you've come to enjoy hanging out with. You don't want anyone to get hurt, but you know they will because they have to, because Hannibal was brought into their lives. And the fact that it succeeds at this lowest level means that everything else is just gravy. Human gravy. 9.0 out of 10. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you particularly to my patrons, my mom, Hamry and Marco, Kat Saracata, Benjamin Schiff, Anthony Cole, at Blasian FMA, Magnolia Denton, Elliot Fowler, and Greg Lucina. If you like this video, great. If not, go fuck yourself. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe. I hope to see you in the next one.